Okay, let's get started, finally. Finally, we're going to get starting here today. Um, so uh, please sign the roster as it's going around, as usual, uh, so you get credit for being here. Um, a couple of administrative things to talk about up front. We have a midterm coming up, and the midterm will be a take-home assignment, and the midterm will be a programming assignment, which means it's not going to be as hard. Well, it's going to be not like a writing a program. Instead, I'm going to ask you questions like, write a class that does this, that has uh, two data members, that has three constructors, that has, you know, and that's not one of the questions. Don't write that down. But... <laughs> The questions will be like that, so you don't actually have to write a program. It'll be answering questions like, here's a piece of source code, what is this doing? What do you call this? What do you call that? Because what I want to do is make sure you have a good foundation and uh, so that we can start building on stuff. And I'm also, as I mentioned last week, I don't know if anyone remembers, but I said I was going to take a step backwards this week, talk about object-oriented design. Because today we're putting the pieces together. And uh, what I mean by that is taking all the concepts that we've talked about so far in terms of the programming, putting the pieces together, and taking a step back and talking about the concepts again. Because once you actually, and this is kind of like a review almost of everything we've talked about so far. Because once you start writing the code, and hopefully you've started that already, and once you start implementing the things, then you kind of lose focus. Most students lose focus about you know, what, what, what is the constructor used for, you know, or what is, you know, what does an abstract mean, what does static actually mean, and things like that. So what, what the hope is today is to kind of go back, and now that things are starting to look hopefully a little bit more familiar to you, hit the object-oriented concepts today, and kind of review the entire concept of the design, and the way that these object-oriented programs look and feel, and how they're different than traditional style programs. So hopefully that'll kind of put the pieces together, as the slide says, putting the pieces together. <laughs> so nothing new, nothing new today, because I think I've hit enough new stuff, and I've hit all of the information that's going to be on the midterm. So the midterm is covered all the way up through to today. It'll be available, I'll talk about it next week, and I'll put it out on the bhacker.com site so you have it next week. You'll have three or four weeks to do it, and uh, it'll be due before the end. You know, it will actually have a due date on it. The TAs will also send out an email message to uh, let you know that it's available and it should be worked on in the exact due date, which I haven't really picked yet. But it'll be three or four weeks or something of that nature. And I will also have what, call, what we're calling the CSLO. I'll also have that available next week as well. Because you really want to do that and you really want to do this CSLO, which is going to be a writing assignment. But that one's not going to be due until the very end of the course. But I don't have it written yet, so I'm going to make it available. That one will be due at the final exam day. The final exam is an in-class final exam that you have to attend in person. Um, so make sure you plan on that. But the midterm is a take-home. You don't have to show up actually to take it physically in the class. But it will be due. It will have a due date that will be before the end of the class. Because what we're going to try and do is hopefully do some of the grading before the end of the class rather than waiting until the last week or so, so we get you guys can turn stuff in, hopefully. And um, I think next week I'll also take a look at the I2 EMS as well and see. I think we have all of the assignments ready, all the links are ready. So when you submit, we have five programming assignments. When you submit those assignments, make sure you use the I2 EMS for that. They cannot be emailed. Um, so no, don't email them to the TA, don't email them to me. They must be uploaded into the I2 EMS. And, um, We'll take it from there, essentially. Um, and then we'll hopefully be giving you some grades before the end of the term so you know how you're doing. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do today is kind of go over an overview of object-oriented software design programming, putting the pieces together, as I call it. And um, I highly encourage you to start working on those assignments. You should be able to do the first two uh, at this point. In fact, you could probably do them all, but I haven't talked about applets and stuff like that yet, or the swing. So. We have some material left to cover, but at this point, what I want to do is kind of reinforce the foundational material. And uh, what we're looking at, and what I want to do is, I've had some students already send me source code, already send me their temperature class and their driver program. And I see, like, maybe through about 15 of them that I've looked at so far. And I highly encourage you, if you have questions about it, send me your source code, but give me the files. 
some students have like cut and pasted them and put them into Microsoft Word. It's hard for me to compile it that way. So when you just send me an email, bhackeritu.edu, attach the two files, driver and the temperature.java, and I can give you some critique on it. So what I'm going to do, because all the critique I've given so far is pretty, almost practically identical, <laughs> I'm going to hopefully cover those points. To those of you who haven't done the assignment yet, who might actually be thinking about, you know, and, and so I can kind of head off some questions you might actually have, hopefully, I don't know. Uh, but we had some similar issues. I shouldn't say issues, similar mis misunderstandings in terms of the, the design concept. All right, so, uh, so again, putting the pieces together. And uh, what we're looking at in terms of the design is uh, going over, and, and, and this slide set is up for visual aid. You can read it. I'm probably going to talk differently than the slides. But uh, what we're looking at is the self-contained entities that are composed of the data and the operations on the data. And you almost have to think in an object-oriented kind of fashion in order to put all of these pieces together. So you, hopefully you've got the concept of the class down. And every unit of the program gets built in terms of a class. And that class, when instantiated, turns into the object. So what I really want to do is talk about object behaviors today, talk about the states, the properties, the characteristics of those objects, and how they're supposed to be working together or communicating. So the programmer thinks and defines the attributes and the behaviors of objects. Even your main driver program is an object. And uh, often the objects are modeled after real world entities. And uh, hopefully, you know, you might be thinking about this going, well, when I write a program, I'm talking about, you know, Fahrenheit and Celsius and temperatures. Those really are real world entities when you think about it. And it's more of a, on the lines of not actually kind of considering that I'm writing a software program and more on the lines of figuring out a framework, which is a little different. Because in the old days when you learned how to write a software program, you started out top of the program and you had function that led to another function or you had a procedure or you had lines of code. And you thought like a programmer. And that doesn't help you at all in terms of object orientation because you really need to do is start thinking like a real world object creator. Um, you know, like, it's, it's slightly, I mean, I shouldn't say slightly, it's a significantly different type of thinking. The objects are modeled after real world entities, much, very, much different approach. So, you actually have to consider the components of object orientation in order to see this big picture in terms of putting the pieces together. This is that acronym I came up with, uh, like, week one or two, when I defined object orientation for you. But I really want to kind of break it down for you in this lecture and put the programming code into the framework. So we have abstraction, polymorphism, inheritance, and encapsulation. And it spells out a pi, if you want to remember it that way. And uh, on the midterm, I know I'm going to ask you to give me an example of abstraction. And give me an example of what's meant by polymorphism in writing code. You know, how do you implement that when you're writing source code? And how, how is that used? And also inheritance. And now uh, we could probably figure out inheritance because we just talked about it. It's every time you use the word extend from one class to another class. We also talked about interfaces that gives us encapsulation. Uh, we also talked about abstract classes um, as well. So some of these concepts kind of fit in. And, and then in terms of the way that the programming constructs fit in, there's also the way that the design is created that encompasses this. Down in the bottom, I got the software engineering issues. These are all related to software engineering issues. Um, in fact, the reason why object orientation was invented was because there was a deficiency in old style programming. You know, it was programmers thinking like programmers. It was writing code sequentially. It had nothing to do with the real world or the real application environment. Um, so this is. It's kind of weird, but the whole concept is totally fed on the concept of improving software engineering methodologies and making a more foolproof, more reliable. And if you're in my software engineering course, this is about talking about reliability and dependability at this point <laughs> in terms of how we can implement that with programming. Um, okay, so we know, all know that the objects is the class. Hopefully we've gotten that part down. And we've created the hello world, and so we know that every single component of this program that we're writing is a class. There's nothing else in there. Well, now some of you are probably going, what do you mean? 
Well, there's interface classes, abstract classes, public classes, private classes, protected classes, but they're all classes. They're all a variety of a class. We have different types of components that we can use when we put them all together, and they all fit together, to, and they all turn into, and they all facilitate the use of objects. So just imagine that there's, even if it's a driver, it's still a class. It's not a program. Because I had one student send me an email, and I, I will leave names out probably because I can't pronounce half your names anyway, but <laughs> who said, this is my program and this is the class that it works with. And it's like, no, it's really your entire, it, that's a class that you wrote. The driver program is a program, and I, you know, it's a program, but that's not a program, that's not a program, it's all one. And then it kind of gets into the concept of distributed computing if you think about it. The program is a separate existence than all of the classes. And it's using all of the classes together that creates the program as an abstraction. So in old style programming, you wrote you had an executable file. And that was the program. Here you can't really call it a program. You have a this class, you have a that class, you have a this class, you have a that class. It's all classes. So um, if you get the terminology down, you'll never you'll never forget the concept. Class generally contains private data and public operations called methods. Every one of the 15 programs, actually 16 it, right this, because I just got one today. <laughs> None of your data members were marked private in 16 examples that I've looked at so far, which tells me you probably aren't getting the concept. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. In the class itself, when you define it, you should always, by default, make all of your data members private because that encapsulates the data inside of the class and it makes it uh, resistant especially when you talk about inheritance and the use of the class because what you really want is the methods inside of the class to essentially control the data and what the data has as a value if you don't specify them out as being private as an access method and I've talked about access methods public private protected I got more of it in the slide set coming up if you've forgotten but it's actually kind of important as a programming practice to put those keywords in there. Um, although some of my examples don't have them in there, they, were, aren't, they weren't in there for simplicity sakes. But real programmers, you put it in there. Because when you start building your classes, and we've seen inheritance already, um, you have to think about the future. What happens further down the road as life, as the world evolves and my object grows and other objects are built on my object, how do we maintain the integrity of that object? Well, we keep this philosophy down of making the private data and public operations. So if the data is private, that way only those operations can control it. And so I'm actually going to talk about what's meant by data in terms of its state and its behaviors to kind of put it into an object-oriented term for you. And this is all, everything I'm talking about today is all stuff we've covered so far. This is a total review of everything put into object-oriented perspective. So we have object types. That's another kind of concept that I think has been missed so far. Um, we have types of objects. We have objects that keep temperature values. It's a temperature type. We have driver program is a driver type. It's an interface to the temperature class, if you've worked on it. And I'm talking about the first assignment, if you're clueless about this temperature stuff. Um, the class is an object type. It comes in different shapes and forms. And when you create it, you define a class by defining the attributes and the behaviors of the new type. And that's where you get those data members, and that's where you get those member functions, or those operations, and then the, the data that's being stored. So we have attributes, and we have behavior. So attributes are the data members. Those are the private parts of that class. And the behavior is the defined by the methods, the methods, member functions, also another word for that. And hopefully by repeating all of these different ways of saying it, you'll get a, you know, it'll be ingrained in you and you'll just start remembering it, hopefully. <laughs> but those are always public. They're public because how are we going to get at those private data members? And there is absolutely no rule that says you have to make it this way. Because here's what another, oh, about three or four students came back and said, but it works. I'm like, yeah, it works. Like, you can always write a program that works, you know? <laughs> it will always compile, it will always run just fine. But this program over here might be better than this program over here. 
this one actually might be following proper object-oriented design methodologies. This one here, they both work, but one of them works what better than the other. In terms of creating the object, we all know we write a class, we define a class, does not result in the object creation. So we don't have an object until we create the instance of the object. That's what's meant by instantiation. And uh, keep in mind, this is actually lecture number 11. You're going to need this for the midterm because I'm not going to give you plain English. I'm going to say instantiate an object of the class blah, 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 blah. And you're going to be looking at me, what does instantiate mean? And I'm not going to answer any questions like, what does it, yeah, I'm not going to tell you what, that's part of the, that's part of the drill. So you know you're going to use new, you're going to say, you know, new temperature is equal to, I mean, my temperature, whatever. Temperature, my temperature is equal to new. I'm, I was thinking, I was writing C++ code earlier today, so I'm like, <laughs> I'm backwards now. I have to think about Java. You're going to write this source code in Java to say new object of that class. Creates an instantiation. It creates an instance of the class. You can have many variables of the same type of the same instance. Also, you probably want to keep in mind the superclass subclass relationship. And I'll go over the whole constructor stuff again as well. Uh, inheritance enables us to define new classes. And that's what's meant, actually. The whole concept of inheritance is the whole extending one class from another class. That's all inheritance is. And the rules that are associated with it. And you've learned the rules, hopefully, or you've been exposed to the rules so far. So inheritance enables us to define new classes called subclasses that inherit the properties of an existing class. And uh, so the newly derived class is a specialized version, specialized by adding properties specific to it. And so the word specialized is actually kind of common. And believe it or not, all of this stuff that I'm telling you is common among different programming languages. The syntax for how do you implement it is different. The concept is identical. So you're learning C++ now as well. I mean, you're learning Java, C++, any object-oriented language you're learning, C Sharp, anything. It's all the same. Um, so we all have the same superclass subclass relationship, and we know that subclasses um, have are inherited from superclasses, which could be inherited from a superclass. So you can have as many classes as you want in the line, and you also know that a subclass can be a superclass and vice versa. They can play multiple roles. It depends on where they land in the hierarchy. So um, because what I'm going to do is probably is ask you a question, give you a hierarchy, and say, what is the subclass of such and such? <laughs> what is the superclass of such and such? So you can actually kind of see where, you know, what's the subclass, what's the superclass. Uh, so I'm not going to give all the midterm answers away, however. <laughs> so I am giving a lot of them away, but <laughs> not all of them. I only had the thing half written, so you're not going to get the second half. <laughs> so. All right, defining objects. So an object during your program is nothing more than the object instantiations. This is why if you've gotten feedback from me, I've said already, your driver program's too big. Put all that functionality into the class. Because some people actually took and created a class because that was what the requirement was. But all of their comparisons between Fahrenheit and so were in the driver program. And then, or they had two separate sets of variables. Like they declared a variable in the driver in fact, this is like all, almost 100% of all the programs I've seen so far have duplicate sets of variables. <laughs> like, they have a variable for the temperature, they have a variable for the Celsius or the Fahrenheit for the, for the kind, and it's in the driver program, and then they also have it over here in the class, and they're using both. So, I mean, it's like, why create a variable when all you have to do is ask the user, take it as input, send it to the class, and you got it. You don't need two sets of the same variable. You only need one set. So the theory is you got extremely small, and I keep saying this over and over again, but I don't know if that's hitting home yet, small driver program. The classes are doing all the work for you, all of it. They're doing the comparison, they're doing everything. So a lot of people have problems figuring out, well, what belongs in the class? What belongs in the driver? It's hopefully what I'm trying to tell you today. So when we think of objects, we have to think of these three components, identity, state, and behaviors. And then we know what belongs in each one of the class. If a temperature has an ability to figure out if it's a temperature, it should know whether it's a Fahrenheit or a Celsius. If you have a temperature object, it should, shouldn't it be able to figure out what it, what it is? So there's no need to put the comparison in the driver program. That function actually belongs, that functionality belongs over there in that class that's called temperature, 
Because all those temperatures, they have to, like, you know, be intelligent temperatures, hopefully, and know about each other and know who they are and how to, how to change from one to the other if they wanted to change. Because if you think of the concept of reuse, if you put it all in the temperature class, next time you have to deal with temperatures, you already have the functionality. You only write it once, you reuse it over and over again. So when you make a new instance of a temperature in your driver, today, your driver, a year from now, two years from now, you don't have to reinvent the wheel anymore. The temperature behavior is already part of the temperature. So a lot of this actually breaks down to this concept of identity, state, and behaviors. And I'm going to spend a lot more time on this right now, actually, to tell you what's meant by that. So identity. <laughs> This is when we know something belongs in the temperature class versus the driver program. Driver program makes instances of objects. It's the driver. Its identity is nothing more than to organize all of your objects. Your temperature is the one that does all the calculations on the temperatures. And I'm going to say 15 out of 16. I didn't look at. I didn't look at yours, so I don't know. But most of it had the calculation. No, your side's calculation is happening in the in the. The calculation should happen in the temperature class, not in a driver class, is what I'm saying. So the identity is the property of the object that distinguishes it from other objects. Easier said than done. Failure to recognize the difference between the name and the object and the object itself is the source of many errors in object-oriented programming. Yeah, it's like the name of the object is temperature, but the object knows how to calculate, how to, how to change from Fahrenheit to Celsius. It knows how to do other stuff. There's other things you can do with temp. I don't know what you can do with temperatures. <laughs> Outside of comparisons, that's about it. But there's other types of examples out there where you have objects that the functionality of the object, it's like multiple personalities or something. And this is the other problem. When we start growing this concept into more sophisticated programs, then you have multiple identities inside of the one object and you're wondering is this a temperature or is this a print object or is you know what kind of object is this and that's where all the confusion happens and then people start using objects that don't necessarily belong in the right in the right kind of uh, right kind of picture and uh, the other thing too is knowing when to stop on one object and to inherit another one from it uh, which is kind of interesting because you know you might have different types of well you could break temperature out in, into three different objects. You could have a base temperature, and then you could have a Celsius temperature object, and then a Fahrenheit temperature object, if you wanted to. It seems kind of tedious. I mean, for something that small, you'd put it all in temperature. But for bigger concepts, bigger programs, at one point you have to decide how many objects should I make out of that, and what kind of simulator, similarities there are. And what most beginner people will do is they won't think about the inheritance at all. Instead, they'll have a Fahrenheit object and a Celsius object without any temperature. And they'll duplicate the behavior in here and in here. And then you'll see another class that's also duplicated. Another class that's also duplicated instead of growing it through reuse. Um, so reuse is actually kind of helpful because it cuts down on the lines of code that you have to write. makes things run easier. All right, so that was everything you ever wanted to know about identity in terms of a refresher on that state. So we have different states of objects, and the states is the data, if you remember that already. Um, the data members and member functions that we have been creating so far in our programs, these are the ones that I say make them private. When in doubt, make them private. <laughs> because do you want the state, of, do you want somebody else to tell you whether you're happy or sad? <laughs> Now you, yourself, tell yourself whether or not you're happy, hopefully. You, yourself, tell yourself your state of mental state. Your, tell you whether or not you want to walk, talk, drink coffee, go to the bathroom. I don't know. All the things that you do as behaviors is determined upon the states of the measurements, like bladder full, bladder empty, thirsty, not thirsty. You know, Those are different variables that change state. In your program, you actually have to think the same way. Your objects have states. So the states are the values that are associated with the properties. That's why they're always private. You know, you don't want them to be, you don't want someone else telling you, you have to go to the bathroom. No, I don't. It's like what you tell kids. It's time to go to the bathroom. Oh, no. It's like, no, no, yeah, it's time to go because the next stop is in 200 miles. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go. 
That's what you're doing when you make those variables public and you tell them, you tell the object you're going to the bathroom and you're telling them what to do. So, anyway, they should be self regulating, hopefully, if they're adult objects, that is. All right, so state, the object encompasses all of the static properties. I'll talk about static in a few. And the object plus the current dynamic values. So we call them dynamic values because at any one moment in time, the object's state is changing because these objects are alive. <laughs> so the states are constantly changing. Um, this concept actually will come in handy when we start talking about iteration and components, excuse me, lists and uh, comp uh, compartments, all sorts of different concepts I'm going to start in with next week. Deals with the state concept. So it's not a bad idea to have a good foundation on that. And the fact that those values are dynamic. And uh, we have state that belongs to the object itself, instance variables, and then we also have class level state, if you remember that. State that belongs to all objects. So we can tell all objects, it's time to go to the bathroom, <laughs> outside of the object. And we can tell all objects individually if we want to, but we want to have the object tell itself. So the property is an inherent or distinct characteristic trait, quality, or feature that contribute to making the object uniquely an object in terms of its property by definition. So we'll use the word attribute or data member to refer to the state of the object. And here's some states and some real life objects that uh, can probably relate to a little bit better. So we have properties. The elevator travels up and down. The vending machine accepts coins. The clocks indicate the current time. Because in, uh, in a regular old programming procedural style that you're familiar with already without object orientation, before object orientation came around, you needed to store a piece of data, you created a variable. And you use the variable and you say, well, i is equal to 10. And you say, i is equal to i plus j. And you, you, used the, you used variables to juggle information around. Now you don't do the same thing. You don't do that anymore. Now you use variables to keep track of state. And the state is, is the elevator up or down? Is, are there coins? How many coins have been inserted into the vending machine? And they're updated differently. And so sometimes the other classic problem, and I've seen it already in maybe about seven of the 15 programs that I've looked at so far, or 16 programs, is that you create a variable out in the driver program that's really keeping track of a state that's supposed to be inside of the class. And you're using that variable instead of the, instead of using the state of that particular object that you created, you're using the variable. And you might think, well, that works. That's fine because you have duplicate. You have that you have that class member, that piece of data that's inside the class, but you also have what you took from the user, and you're using what you took from the user, and you added it to a variable because you're so used to these variables, and you're manipulating that value. Only problem is is it's not utilizing object orientation. <laughs> it's not using, utilizing the instance of that object at all. Because what I have had actually, the one key question to ask yourself is where have you made those instances of those objects? If this instances of the objects appear right at the bottom, and that's the first thing I look at actually. I take a look at the driver program and instantly I can tell if you've made the two instances at the bottom of the driver program, the very last two lines are making two instances of your object. Yeah, you haven't used anything. You haven't used the state of the object. Because you make the object right in the beginning and then you let the objects talk to each other. And you let the objects manipulate the data and per their state and not the variables that you collected that data with. So sometimes, actually, some teachers like to give you a program that doesn't use input. You know, that takes and you actually have to have the objects create and use that data and then call it from the object because that forces you to kind of see the concept. Because as soon as you start taking input from the user, you start adding it, assigning it to variables, and then you start using the variables just like you're used to. Oh yeah, this is programming. When you should just hand it over immediately to that object and let the object state variables update and then manipulate the instances of those objects through the methods that are created in those objects. I don't know if I got home or not. Values. We have values that we can give to the properties. The values might be the current floor, the number of coins deposited, and uh, the number of minutes since the last hour or something if we have a time object. Now the last component we actually have to think about and imagine is the behavior. 
And this is when I'm going back to, you know, converting Fahrenheit to Celsius and back and forth. What are these objects doing in terms of their behavior? The behavior is how an object acts and reacts in terms of its state changes and in the interactions. So an operation is uh, some action that one object performs upon another in order to elicit a reaction, a response. So yes, objects actually talk to each other. <laughs> so your driver program is an object. Your driver program is talking to the temperature program. So another thing that I've seen happen, and this is usually when they've created those very, they've created the two instances as the last two lines of the program, of the driver program, because they've done all the everything else, and then, oh yeah, let's make a couple instances of those, uh, those objects, is that the objects aren't talking, the driver program is not talking to the objects. It didn't create them until the very last minute. How could it have talked to them? So everybody else is now, now, now the people that are listening are going to move those instances to the top of the driver program. <laughs> I'm still going to be looking to see if you're actually making them talk. <laughs> so. All right, so the behavior is the reaction between the objects. An operation is some action that one, well, I put the word C++ in here. One, um, an operation is one action that an object performs on another in order to elicit a reaction. You learn the word method to describe the object behavior. Actually, this, these concepts apply to our C++ and Java. In fact, I've given this lecture for C++, same class taught in C++ versus Java. So it's not language specific. The concept is universal. So invoking a method causes the behavior to take place. So these are methods. And uh, design people call them messages. I don't know. I call them member functions. <laughs> they come in different words, come in different ways. So, so what are the three characteristics of an object? Identity, state, and behavior. You got it. So you're the person in the front row is listening, so that's good. All right, so the class. And what, what other characteristics of those objects do you have? None. All you got, all you have are three. You got identity, state, and behavior. Object does nothing else. That's all you have. If you think about humans, we have identity, state, and behavior as well. We also have feelings. <laughs> Objects don't have feelings. They're not real. Although they mimic things in the real world, they're not. They don't have human emotions or feelings. You, can't, you cannot insult an object. It doesn't work that way. All right, classes. Our definitions are blueprints of the class objects. We've seen that already. There's descriptions. So if I said write a description of the object that takes in temperature, you'd write public class temperature and you'd write the template, or you'd give me the description of this object in terms of its class, its blueprint. So let's talk about a little example here on how to use inheritance correctly. Uh, so to make a car, the manufacturer, and those of you who have had software engineering with me have seen this example already, unfortunately. Uh, but it's, it's actually kind of an interesting example, but you'll see more of the object-oriented parts of it now. Um, manufacturer must first build the design and uh, build the first car. And then every car that you build after that comes easier. You know, if you're manufacturing it on an assembly line. The object is the instance. So when we create an instance, we can have, and this is the other problem. In fact, I've seen this, believe it or not, in, uh, in uh, programs that students write. They duplicate the objects. So actually, let me just flip ahead. They need an instance of a BMW or an Audi. So they create a BMW object, or they created a BMW or an Audi object, and they create an instance of that. But really, they're all just cars. Because if you think of the concept, you have a class definition called car, then you can think of an Audi, a BMW, Corvette, any car type you want as a type of car, type of car. So here we would have one class called student, and we would have all of you as different instances. In this room, you'd be different instances of the same class student. Believe it or not, I have actually seen this before, <laughs> which is the only reason why I'm mentioning it. I haven't seen it with the first assignment because we only have temperature. But I have had seen, like, you know, people duplicating the wheel with, you know, we have student A, student B, student C. They're all different classes. And they make an instance of student A, they make an instance of student B, an instance of student C. When all they do is make one student class and make three instances of that same class, this is what makes the concept more effective. So if we only have one of everything, and everything is derived from everything else in terms of inheritance, we don't have that much programming left to do. And each object is kind of self-identified in terms of its identity. 
So here we notice that all of the objects are the same type. All of the objects are cars. If cars came from something else like vehicle as a base class, they'd all be vehicles as well. We've seen that in uh, inheritance so far. So. Uh, so we have Audi, BMW, Corvette, all instances of the same type, although one's an Audi and one's a Corvette. It's still all a car. So what, unfortunately what ends up happening is you have to break down your program. You have to think, well, I'm writing a student registration program. I have students, I have the registration process, I have classes, I have rooms to schedule the classes in. You kind of pick out, and it's actually kind of better to do like a brainstorming object list. And then you take all those objects and you cross out the duplicates. You know, well, seminar and classroom, that's the same thing. <coughs> Cut that out. And uh, this teacher can teach five, oh, we only need one teacher here. We don't need like five teachers. So this is all the same teacher on each one of these classes. And you kind of reduce the list down to one of each item. And then you turn those into the class list. And uh, there's noun extraction. There's so many different methodologies that people use for this. And this is where you get the object-oriented design books where they vary a lot. Some of them have off-the-wall methodologies for figuring out how many objects and it's based upon you know, the words and the description. Some of them have it, you know, you build this other model, and you take it from this other model. Or, you know, I don't actually follow any of that stuff. I used to kind of try and use common logic, and what ends up happening to me is I end up stripping it out. Unfortunately, what you don't want to do is strip it out without knowing what you're doing, because you could put the whole program in one class, <laughs> which is what you don't want to do. You just strip it out completely. You can reduce it down to one. Anything can be reduced down to one class, which... Not so, not so bright. So you kind of have to kind of break it out, and then I kind of push it back a little bit when I see some duplication, when I see some things that can be optimized a little bit. All right, so class is an object. A uh, object is an instance of exactly one class. We have single. This is what's meant actually by single line identity, single line inheritance. One class is only from one other class, from one other class, from one other class. Although objects can have multiple identities related upon the inheritance of that class. So a car can be a vehicle, can be a, you know, we've seen that already as well. Uh, so the Corvette is a car. Corvette belongs to the car class. And so once the class is defined, you can have many instances. Once the blueprint is created, defining the class itself, we talk about the properties and the behaviors. Um, it's kind of important to actually kind of think about the methodology in terms of how you're writing the class. In languages like C or C++, it's easier because you can kind of, I mean, C++, you can group it by the access method, like private, public, and you can put all the stuff in there. As I've mentioned before, I like to put all, in fact, I've seen this in like maybe 16 of the 16 programs I've seen so far. I've put the data members up front, so I got that point across. Other people like, you don't have to. You can put the data members on the bottom if you want to and put all the member functions up there. There's reasoning behind that, actually, because if you do that, who cares about the data members? The class implementation doesn't work. That you can't, if they're private like they should be, you shouldn't be touching them, which is that philosophy why they put them on the bottom. Nobody uses them. It's for the class, but the user, the interface to it, the public interface to it isn't going to touch them. Why, put it, why, why clutter the top of your program with them? Eh, I don't know. I do that because when I'm writing the class, I kind of can think, you know, oh, that's what that variable's called, and that's what that variable's called, and I can use it in the methods. But, you know, there's a reasoning. There, there's there's a actually a good reason why they're put on the bottom sometimes. And those are the properties. The behaviors are the methods, member functions, if you remember that. And uh, instance variables. Let me, let me actually kind of demonstrate this to you in the next couple of slides here. Because uh, I've actually had some people using static already. <laughs> and you should not have to use the keyword static in your program for number one. There's absolutely no need to use static. The keyword static is used to create a class level variable. We're not, we don't have class, we're not working with that concept. We're working with instances on this first program. And what that meant is that the variable, each variable, each variable, each instance of each object type is holding its own instance variables. And what's meant by that is that it has its own value for its state. And it shares the same properties. The same, you call the same functions, or you call the same methods, if you want to call them methods, functions, whatever, on each instance. So you say, you know, print value, you know, so my object number one, my object number two, one dot print value, two dot print value, those are just the same. 
But the, the states themselves and what the information is being housed by each object is unique to each object in an instance environment. There's absolutely no need to make them global, to make them work for all, everybody on a class level. So here's an example. Joe's car has uh, four gallons of gas, and while John's car only has 10, the amount of gas in one car might change without the amount of gas in the other car changing. This helps you keep track of each one. And this is why you put the instance, excuse me, this is why you set the states on the objects and don't do it in the driver. Long answer short, because it gets confusing. Because it's like in the old days where you had, you know, uh, grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, and you were incrementing things. You had to keep track of which one, which variable belonged to which value, so you can increment everything correctly. I looked at one program, I don't think the person's sitting here, which is good, I can talk about it, that <laughs> had a temperature one, temperature two, and then they were changing the temperature one, but they also had two objects of the temperature instance of the, that they weren't using the instance variables of the objects, instead they took in what they got from the user and they added that to a variable. And they made a mistake actually, they, up, they converted the wrong temperature in the temperature one, temperature two, temperature three, and you know, all these different temperatures. And it's like, well, you're not, you can't go wrong if you keep them organized under the objects because the object only knows about its temperature. It doesn't know about anybody else's. There's absolutely no way you can make a mistake with that. Where you make mistakes is updating the wrong counter for the wrong object outside of the object. So that's how counters actually are more effective inside of the object. The object can have its own counter value. How many times did the object print something? How many times did the object get converted? You can keep track of how many conversions were made on each object if you wanted to. Because um, it has history, actually, in terms of those counters. So the amount of gas in one object doesn't change the amount of gas in another. The instance objects of the state will have the same set of instance variables. The combination of the values of these instance variables is known as the object state. So now when I say, now because I've reiterated this so many times, when I say state, you know what I'm talking about, hopefully. Data member? <laughs> Piece of data that's associated with the object, in the instance of that object. All right, so instance variables. So now we have maximum speed. Maximum speed is equal to 155 for the Audi. 165, this is just arbitrary numbers, by the way. I have no, absolutely no idea if these speeds are even possible with these cars. Um, although I could put a smart car on there and put maximum speed 80, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Who knows? All right, but you now you get the point, hopefully, that these are held per instance. Class variables, that's where that keyword static comes in. You only put static on there if you want to access the variable outside of the instances of the classes. Static doesn't work with instances. It works with class level variables. And uh, you put it on there because you want to keep track of how many of a particular object. Or you want to change the rules. I used to say this, and uh, I don't know if it's politically correct, but when you put static when you start creating class variables and start using um, static, you start playing God. <laughs> because, and that's when people look up and go, what? Okay, it's not politically correct because I said the G word. But it's like somebody coming down and saying, all right, you people over here, you're going to die in a car crash. You know? Or you people over here, you're going you're gonna to win the lottery. Or you people over here, it's like somebody else outside of the object environment, the object it has any control over it at all. Because if they did, they wouldn't go in the car crash. And everyone would go over here and win the lottery. But that doesn't work that way. Instead, outside of the class, outside of the instances of the class, somebody else is coming in and telling the classes what to do. It's like, you know, you're going to go to the bathroom now. Okay. <laughs> because it's, it doesn't have anything to do with the instances of the object. So they're not used very much, if you can imagine this. Because in the driver program, you're going to use class variables to keep track and to control the objects. If you want to kill all the objects off and get rid of them all, you can do it at the class level. If you want to keep track of how many people, how many students are enrolled in the class, you can keep a counter and then you can have the behavior of each one of the objects figure out by looking at a class level variable. It's 25. Okay, the 26th student that tries to enter into the class gets put on a wait list if the maximum was set on 25 or something. So it's out of the student's control whether or not they got into the class or not. Somebody else set a rule for that class instance that said, if you're 
instance number 26 that's created of this particular object type, you don't get into the class, you're on the wait list. You know, so it's behavior control playing God outside of the instance levels. That's the only thing. So what do you need to do that for a temperature program? You don't need to use that for a temperature program. Temperatures are keeping track of themselves, actually. The temperatures, you're, you're just hopefully making the temperatures do all the work as well. So you're not controlling the temperatures. So in the class of the car, uh, in the case of the car class, you can define a maximum uh, allowable speed by law. And so now the classes can't go any higher than 155. And they can change it. That's, so that's what the government does. Changes it and says, hey, now, maximum speed now is 65. Actually, for the longest time, believe it or not, in this country, you guys weren't here, I know, it was 55. The speed limit on the freeway was 55. I can't believe going that slow. Now it's 65. Because, you know, it was back when they were starting to think that fuel was going to be an issue. This is like 20 years ago or so, 30 years ago. Yeah, fuel ended up being an issue. <laughs> but we got more fuel efficiency at 55 than we did at 65. But now they've changed the design of cars, so now we go 65 a lot easier. Anyway. Long story short, somebody changed the speed limit on us, so now we got 65. Actually, some places it's 70. Yeah, I'm waiting for it to become 80. Then my smart car is gonna die. It can't go any. It can't go any faster than that. Someone, someone from the class level has to come down and set the maximum value for all smart cars to the higher, higher maximum speed value. So. All right, so maximum speed is 155. Let's say that applies to all of the classes. So. If one of the instances of the class tries to go above 155, it can't. Right? It will hopefully it'll have some error. We haven't talked about exception handling yet, but that's coming up in a couple weeks. So. All right. So the class variable may also be used to keep track of things such as how many instances exist of each student, and that's the example I gave you already with enrollment. So here we can keep a counter how many uh, how many record how many cars are in the garage. So we can have maximum number is equal to three. What ends up happening here and the way that we fix this variable is that every new instance updates this global, I don't want to call it global, this class level variable that gets incremented on each new instance. So this is something you normally see in the constructor because the constructor is going to automate the behavior for you, which brings up another good point. So. This is why I'm having you create like five or six constructors that, you know, duplicate functionality. You probably could have just created one or two function, you know, constructors. But it's to demonstrate the point that you want to make the class inst instantiation process the most effective possible. Because what you're trying to do is cut down on work. So when the objects are created, you can automatically set the maximum speed. Uh, you, know, you can set the level of this, set the level of that automatically and increment any counter that needs to be incremented and not actually have to write a single line of code after that. You know, it just made an instance and it makes it more powerful, which is why those constructors are kind of important as a concept. Some people never create a constructor. In fact, I've looked at senior, not senior level, junior level, but working in senior level positions, people that have written source code without ever creating, because you don't have to. You don't have to create a constructor, but people who use constructors, I go, oh yeah, they know what they're looking at. They know what they're doing because they're automating everything. They're ensuring that values are getting set correctly. So the parallel to this is in the old C, C++ days when you said integer i, but you never set a value to i. You just said i, and then lo and behold, further down, you're printing out i, and it gives you an error message. Well, if you have a constructor, you're never going to do that because you can initialize everything all in one shot when the object, even if you just set it to zero, you know. What you don't want to do, and this is another bad programming habit, you don't want to say private integer i is equal to one. <laughs> have private integer i and then have the constructor set it to equal to one because now each instance is actually creating its own one. It's actually in initializing its own state per instance. When you say one on the top, what ends up happening, lo and behold, is you assume it's zero or you assume it's not set, you end up resetting it somehow. And it ends up becoming two accidentally because you incremented it when it was already one, it wasn't zero. Or the value changed unnaturally because you, you initialized it without the class initializing it. Excuse me, without the instance object in initializing it. 
So in theory, you want the instances of each object to initialize its own variables, its own, its own state, its own data members. Ah, I said that right. Good. <laughs> messages. So let's talk about messages a little bit because there's some confusion about what gets put into a method and what gets put into the driver program. So what do the methods do? They do everything. This is how the classes communicate among each other. So here we have messages in terms of uh, one side says for humans, the other one says for objects. This is how objects talk versus the human. And now what do we got? The object to whom the message is being sent is who the message is for. The name of the method that the object is to execute is what we want the person to do. So object names are actually kind of interesting. That's why you want to say set, get, that's why that kind of behavior and that, and there's no rule that says you have to use set or get. I told you about modifiers and accessors as a concept. People do that because it's easier to remember what the method's doing. It's setting the gas. It's getting the gas. It's, otherwise you get, you know, uh, check the gas. When I check the gas, is it setting it? Is it getting it? <laughs> it's checking it. Okay. There's some vagueness in the name. So actually the message names are actually something you want to think about in terms of writing your program. And those of you who probably have written it probably have already figured out, yeah, it's like convert to Celsius, convert to Fahrenheit. <laughs> those are some good names to use, actually. Any parameter variables that needed by the method is the information that you need, what you're going to need to do it with. And yes, you can take a there, you can take a parameter from one object and send it to another object. And you're not sending that object's data member. So here's the other interesting thing. You can run a method as a parameter to a method from an object. So you can send a message to, a, to a, one object to another and not touch the data members. You're just using methods to do that with. So you can get value of a, because this is the first thing people say, well, what do you mean make them all private? I want to use the value. So you write a method that says get value. You send get value, you know, object one dot get value as a parameter that resolves down to a float or a double or whatever it is into a message to another object, like object two dot something, you know, convert to Celsius get value from object one. So you can actually have one object convert the value of another object's information if you want to. And you can actually mix it. Those objects are pretty functional. Okay, if, you, if you can kind of follow along the logic, you're just sending messages back and forth between objects. So there's no need to actually send data members. You send methods, method calls. So that's why if you go get, set, it's a little easier to you know, get it, set it, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, all right, so, uh, and then, you know, obviously, the, the void comes in handy with that because if you're going to get something, you know, you're going to return a value. If you're going to set something, you're not going to return a value. Why do you need a value that comes out of that? Uh, which is interesting because then you get, you know, traditional C++ programmers who are afraid to use the word void on a method because they were taught you always had to put a data type there. Nothing's void. Well, break that rule. Object orientation, everything should be void if it's really void. Otherwise, you get extra stuff that gets passed back and forth that doesn't need to be passed. If you're doing this over a long distributed network, that actually can make your program run slower. So you, if it's void, leave it alone and make it void. So a method is a small, well-defined piece of code that completes a specific task, and you want the method to actually only produce one task. This is where people go, what? All right, so... If you have a method that's going to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit, it should convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit. It should print it to the screen as well. And this is about, I didn't look on yours, but about maybe 15 out of 16 programs had it printing it. <laughs> when you can have another one that says print the value. So you actually, and you're thinking, well, that's two methods you have to write. But the thing is, is if you have to think about the long term, you have to think about the long run. So you're writing a program right now, and it's using this one class with this driver program. And you know you're going to print it to the screen, so it's really easy to say, you know, convert this to this, and then print it to the screen. Great. But what if you, like, in the future, take that and use it in a different program? Do you really want it to convert it to the screen? Because it converts it, but do you want it to actually put any output out on the screen? This actually happens in professional programs. When you run the program runs and it prints something, you know, where did that come from? It's like, oh, because somebody put that in a method. 
like a long, long time ago because they had that functionality of printing the value to the screen after it was converted. The better method, create a method that converts Celsius to Fahrenheit. And then another one that prints, another method that you have to call right after that, that prints the value to the screen. That gets the value. For, or just one that says get, and then have the driver program get it and print it to the screen, which is probably the better way of doing it. You know, get the value rather than doing because what if what if you wrote this program and it was a console application and you have this perfectly running class right now and then you changed it over we learned about applets and we took our temperature program and we turned it into an applet it's going to be useless printing to the screen <laughs> we're probably going to want to put the value in a box on a label or something we're not going to print it to the screen it's going to be a totally different command which is why it actually makes better sense to say get it and just return the value and then have the driver program print it. When we start looking at apples, what we're going to start looking at is the interface. <laughs> the class, the class, the class, the driver. One of the parts is the little applet thing. It's, it's the GUI part of it. It's the swing part of it. It's totally separate. Because what we can do now is take this fully running, in fact this happens all the time as well, this fully running application, turn it into an applet, turn it into a GUI application, switch the interface on it. The functionality is identical. We don't have to rewrite the program. We just take the interface class out and swap it in with another one. And then we end up with a, you know, the program of our choice to run in whatever it is we want. So, in fact, you get that when you, in fact, that's how easy it is to make like Java beans and stuff like that. It's just functionality underneath an interface. You're just switching the interface out. You know, so it works on that form, works on that form. Well, it converts everything to this, it does that. And it's more flexible that way and you can reuse the class without having to rewrite it. So. Okay, uh, let's see. So here we go. We have messages and methods. We have the uh, turn on hazards that's just turning on the hazards. It's not printing out a status to the screen that says, hey, hazards are turned on. If we wanted that, we write a different method for it. That's the story I was trying to bring home. Instance methods. We also have class methods. We've seen that already with static. In fact, static can be used with almost anything. So each class has its own methods. And... Uh, they're called instance methods. So if the BMW has four gallons of gas and someone puts six gallons of gas in his or her car, the car now has 10 gallons of gas. Hmm. I don't know. The amount of the gas in the Audi and the Corvette hasn't changed. So I don't know if that was written. I don't know if I said that right. But I hopefully you get the point. If not, let me know. So, All right. So we have uh, the car. We have uh, add gas with another amount. And so we have uh, add gas in each one of the three instances. Methods. All right, so it's also possible that you want the information about an object, and uh, in this particular case, to define methods that send or return messages back. This is the terminology. It's called a method. So it's nothing more than a message is what we've been looking at so far. Don't call them functions. That's how, that's how you look like an amateur when you call it a function. Now, it needs a function to do this. We don't have any functions anymore, although they are functions. They're methods. There's messages and methods, it's the same thing by concept. Um, actually, it's more common to see them called methods. Non-programmers who do software design, because here's the interesting thing, in the old days, if you were a C++ programmer, you did the C++ design, because the design aspect of it and the coding aspect of it was closely knit, closely uh, inter inter interwoven. interwoven. In object oriented, we have object oriented designers who never write an ounce of code. And then we have object oriented programmers who all they do is they take the design and they implement it into the code. So, designers, they call it messages. Programmers, they call it methods. <laughs> so, it depends on what side of the fence you sit on, I guess, as to how you're going to call it. You don't have to know how to write any code at all to write a perfect object oriented design. You take that object oriented design and implement it in C, implement it, implement it in Java with some very, very minor differences. And those are just features of the language that might change maybe about half a dozen or less features that would change. You'd get the same, all practically the same source code, actually. You'd have the same objects. You'd have the same interactions. You'd have the same behaviors. So object-oriented designers, they just sit here and they think about the objects. You think about it, there's a lot of work in that. In fact, most of the work is figuring out the objects figuring out the, the three components, the state, the behaviors, the messages, or state, identity, identity, state, behavior. I forgot them already. So. All right. 
So class methods, as we've seen before, these are methods uh, that uh, God comes down and implements for all of the classes altogether. This might be one that says uh, get rid of everybody. Take everybody out of the garage. Put everybody into the garage. Um, remove all students from a class. I don't know. Give all students A's in the class. That, that, that's a nice method. It's a class level method. So the methods themselves are used to get manipulate the data of all of the objects created by the class, all of the existing objects that are created in the class, and all of the future objects that are created of the class. Now the common perception is people have a tendency to set the class methods over and over and over, or run class methods and set class data over and over again because they need to create a new object and make sure it's set right. So they set it again. So now once you set it once, in you know, 10 years from now, you create an object that's going to have that value <laughs> if the program is still running. I mean, you know, it, it, it's set once, used for everybody. Typical class methods are changing class variables. You hardly ever have a class method that changes instance variables. That's another kind of key thing to look at, and I've seen this before too, which is kind of like, yeah, you, all of a sudden you told everybody in the room you're all 35. Well, if you like 35, as an age. When you guys all are different ages, some of you are probably less than that, I hope. So, I mean, I shouldn't hope. I'm older than that, so. <laughs> I'd love to be changed back to 35. That'd be nice. So. But what you're doing is you're kind of mixing up and you're messing up the environment when you do that. Because there was a reason why, because you started as an object. You started, you got through a certain, your, your state changed to a certain age. And all of a sudden, someone cuts messes you up. That's how you corrupt data in a program. That's how you corrupt and you make mistakes. You have bad calculations because you set everybody's rate of pay to something accidentally. When they all have different rates of pay. You're writing, let's say you're writing a payroll program and you're trying to print out pay receipts. and You have a class method that changed everybody's instance variables. That could cause an issue, source of problems, Program compiles, program runs just fine, but everybody's paycheck gets printed out with the same amount. <laughs> and it actually, believe it or not, happens. It's a logic error. So, because you changed instance variables, probably with a class method or something of that nature. All right. Um, here's just an example of a couple of them set. Uh, you can go through the slide set. It's slide number 11 and kind of see the nitty gritty examples. Um, let's see what we got here. Object learning program, yeah, like a car, BMW. Benefits. Let's, uh, hmm, I think I've already talked about that slide. Benefits. Um, we have modularity. We also have information hiding. So going back to the pie, we talked about abstraction. The object is the abstraction. Abstract data types are abstraction. We have tons of different examples, more than just the class that creates our abstraction. The class abstraction is the object. So. Not a bad idea to know what abstraction is. Haven't talked about polymorphism yet. It's coming up. Um, inheritance. We've looked at that. Also, encapsulation. Encapsulation is really information hiding. Because we've encapsulated everything that's evolved with a temperature inside of a temperature object. Now, when we want to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius in the future, we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to remember the formula. We can just call the method that converts it for us. We've hidden the information associated with the implementation of that. Yeah, it was a small formula, but what if it was a huge algorithm? What if it was a huge process that was occurring? Maybe it was doing a translation and it was doing some MP3 encoding from a wave to an MP3 file or something like that. Maybe it was doing something a little bit more labor intensive. We don't have to worry about how to do all that stuff. We just call the method. That's what's meant by information hiding. And it also gives us the public interface to the class. You've been doing this already if you've been programming because every time you've created an object, an instance of system or something of that nature, you're ra basically running methods on objects without worrying about the functionality. And so all you have to know is the public interface to those methods, which is why we have those interface classes. So the interface type of class is meant just to provide the interface, something we're going to implement. Something that, and that's how we can actually interface multiple different types of classes into one object or into one class. So we've written and maintained everything in module. We have modularity going on, which means we can separate out. This is why you don't want to put everything in one file either, because 
what ends up happening is in the future we can take the temperature class and use it for something else. We can take the driver program, throw it away. You know, it's, it's the driver program. So. Rarely do we actually ever reuse a driver program. It's usually the classes that are kept. And the object has public interface, as I mentioned before, uses to communicate with other objects. And uh, accesses instance of variables called information hiding. The information is hidden. So the interface to the class is the list of public data members and methods, as we've seen. And that interface kind of concept defines the behavior of the class outside of the world, outside of the class implementation, and uh, accesses variables, other types. And the implementation of the class doesn't matter outside of the class, only in the interface matters. Because now we know what methods are available, we just run the method. So, um, which is the public part of it. The methods have to be public. <laughs> well, hopefully we understand why. We don't actually have to make all of the methods public. In fact, some of the methods can be private if they're used inside of the class and they're not part of the public interface. And I don't have you doing anything like that in this class, but that's kind of a more of an advanced kind of thing. We create methods inside to do functionality, to separate things out. The reason why you want to separate things out, the reason why we want modularity is because we can swap. Something's broken, easy to fix, easy to maintain. So object-oriented programs are very easy to fix and maintain because we don't have to recompile everything. We just swap out a component, swap out a method and we're done, essentially, hopefully. So. so we can change the implementation, nobody cares, as long as we keep the class names, excuse me, the method names the same, the public interface. Public interface is nothing more than the name of the method you're actually creating. So the fact that public interface kind of messes a lot of people up sometimes, or the concept of the interface messes, mess, messes with people because you think it's a complex kind of topic like it should be, but it's really not. It's kind of like the word abstract. It's not really, the concept of abstraction is not really that bad either. So. Polymorphism, as we've seen before, the ability of different objects to respond to the same message in different ways. I know I'm going to ask you on the midterm to give me an example of polymorphism in source code. You know the easiest way to do that? <laughs> I'll tell you, because you're sitting here listening, hopefully. Create a class that has multiple constructors that take on different data. So you can create a temperature that's in Fahrenheit, or you can take and create a temperature object that's represented in Celsius. In fact, if you've done the first homework assignment, you already have the code written for yourself. Because <laughs> what does it do? It's an object that takes on, you know, given what it's given, it does different behavior. So something that prints something to the screen, if you don't want to do that, you can say something, an object that prints something to the screen that's a float. An object that prints a string to the string, to the screen, instead of a float, or, you know. Given, given some input, it does the same behavior on it, but it's different input. Adapts, it changes. There's many other, and we actually have a couple more polymorphic kind of things I haven't talked about yet in this class that's coming up. Inheritance, we know that already is too. We inherit extends from one class to another. We add data members, we don't replace. So we can override. So I'll probably have you do some overriding and some overloading, something. And you're probably thinking, oh, this is really bad. But what I'm doing is hopefully I'm going to get taken and have you do an example of each one of the concepts we've talked about. I'm not going to have you write an interface. You don't have to worry about that or use an interface. That would be way too much, I think, actually. But small stuff, yeah. So the new class is a specialization of the existing class. And in terms of our inheritance, we have the hierarchy to think about. We know the super. We know the subs. We know the highest level in the hierarchy is generally the lower level classes that are more specific. So the lower we get, the more specific we get, the higher we get, we just get this concept of an object. <laughs> what is an object? It doesn't do anything at all. It's like a placeholder. Object. And everything inherits from object. Everything below it's a specialized version of an object. So it has functionality. And uh, super sub, we already know that stuff. Oh, this supports reusability, by the way. That's with the reusability component of uh, object orientation. And in our interface inheritance example, and we are getting to the end of this, don't worry. Uh, we have a base class, let's call it a shape. And it represents an abstract notion of a shape. We can build a rectangle, triangle off of a shape. The most important thing to remember about inheritance is to keep the concept consistent, the identities. You don't want to build a, you don't want to build a table from a shape. <laughs> it's a table. Maybe different types of tables from table. But, or a car from shape. Cars wouldn't work out well, or BMW from shape. 
probably would not work out well. So the car is a generic car. We have BMW cars, and then from BMW car, let's see, we can have different types of BMW cars. So here we have car, BMW, Z3, and 3 Series. So I usually I see BMW because people like BMWs, I guess. Next time, I think I'm going to revise and put different kinds of smart cars on there, convertible, kind of whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> trying to make, I'm trying to make this humorous. All right, so uh, the inheritance stuff, actually, I think people are starting to get. We haven't actually started working with it yet. Um, in terms of the assignments. The view of the class, just to reiterate this particular concept, we have the inside and we have the outside view. That's where we get the public and the private. And then we have this protected concept as well to think about. And then that, that's the other thing that most students have a problem with in the beginning. The interface of the class provides the outside view. The implementation of the class is the inside view. And then we have the access methods. So know that it's referred to as an access method. It's kind of important to know because then you can, it's a universal concept, the access method, which is different. We don't get this in traditional C programming because we don't make everything as global or everything is statically scoped or everything has different scope words. We don't actually have scope, if you believe it or not. We have access methods. So. Eh, we sort of do have scope. Inside the method, everything is hidden outside of the method, which is inside. We have local scope, I should say. So, Public, protected, private. I don't, have, I don't think I have to reiterate this point too much. Public is everybody. Private is just within the class. Protected is the outside, no. But classes that want to inherit from the class, yes. So. We don't have friend, and we don't have... Um, we don't have friends, actually. C++ has no. C++ has friends. I don't know if Java has friends. I can't remember. We don't have friends. I don't think. Java is not friendly. <laughs> C++ we have friends. Well, anyway, uh, that's a totally different concept. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, we know the private versus the public. We know the protected. Hopefully, this applies towards data members and member functions. Everything. In fact, the class itself. And then, and as another word of caution, we know that if we use abstract for anything, and not mentioned on the list was the abstract, if we use that for anything inside of the class, the entire class has to be abstract. Um, that actually, believe it or not, messes people up because, you know, they put in, they, they cut and pasted some code in there, and then all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, what happened? Well, because it's an abstract method you put in there. It's like, oh, okay, great. Special member functions, constructors, we know about that. We don't have a destructor. In C++. In fact, I'm not going to ask you about destructors, but I will ask you about constructors on the midterm. This is, this is actually kind of like your midterm review as well, I should say. So. Um, accessing data members, we know about that. Make them private. Access them through the members, the data members themselves, at, through the methods. Uh, accessing class methods are outside of the instances. I'm probably not going to trip you up with that either. So you don't have to worry about that for the midterm, but it's not a bad idea. It's going to be a concept that's going to be discussed on the final, actually, the differences between the class methods and the instance methods and variables and vice versa. So. Static, we know about static, great. Hopefully, I've mentioned it already. I actually kind of talked about it today in terms of making something into a class method or a class variable, class data member. So. Static data members declare the variable as static. Possible to have a single variable that is shared by all instances of the class. So. And, uh, oh, that is Java code. I thought for sure that would be C++. Oh, yeah. That works. Two programming. This is kind of a, I've already covered this stuff, so that's why I'm kind of flipping through it. I talked ahead a little bit. Uh, the structured programming where we have function, function, function versus the object, object, object. If you just actually kind of keep slide number 58 in mind, that's the huge, that's the biggest difference. So that's why you can kind of tell people who do still do structural when everything is in the driver program. So that's why I say don't, don't. Make the driver program small. So. Uh, what do we got here? Data abstraction covered, inheritance of uh, properties, dynamic, oh, we're not going to look at dynamic by that's a different topic. In fact, the last end of this lecture is cut short because I modified, this was originally designed for C++, so I modified it for Java, so it's not going to cover dynamic, we don't have to worry about dynamic memory, actually, we don't have that in Java. In C++, you got to learn about destructors, dynamic memory allocation, like that. We do have it, but it's built in and it's run by the JVM in Java, so it's not, concept exists, we just don't have any programmer control over it. 
So OOP terms versus Java equivalents, the object is the class object, class instance. Instance variable, this is kind of the summary chart of the concepts. Uh, private data members are the instance variables. And the methods are the public member functions, the messages, message passing is calling a function. We don't need to know that. State the objects, this is the conclusion actually. The hierarchy, building the hierarchy. In fact, you'll see the Java docs, ooh, ooh, no, I shouldn't say that. The, uh, the class hierarchy documentation online is done this way. I hate it. You know, it's all condensed and you click on it, it opens up. It doesn't tell you anything. I, I personally, you know, I, I can't stand it because you should, like, put an explanation in here. What does this class do? What does this object contain? It yeah. doesn't. Uh, it just looks like that, <laughs> actually. That's a hierarchy. Anymore. Every car is a wheeled vehicle. So another trick question. Actually, I've asked this before in a midterm, different style midterm, one that was taken in class. I said, you know, gave you an object. How many objects are created in this program? And, like, the answer is five, but we only have one new. A class that was inherited from a class that was inherited, all five levels existed, but, and one object down here on the bottom. So if I said a car with two doors, how many objects would that be? Well, it would be a car. It would also be a wheeled vehicle. It would also be a vehicle, so it would be three. So it's counting up the hierarchy to how many of those objects actually are part of that object, and you are actually creating three objects. Because they all have, you know, a car is a wheeled vehicle, which is also a vehicle. So you have, which kind of reiterates the point, you have all of the data members, all the functionality of all of those objects as well. Because although you are a student, you're also a human, and you are also um, whatever you happen to be as a human. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you're also other things as well <laughs> that you've inherited. Um, all right, so we have the inheritance base class, the derived class, the terminology. Something is derived from a base. Derives are the subs. Base is the supers. And they're, they're also called specializations. So next week we're going to talk about containment, I, I believe. I'm not sure. Or more about the composition of... Um, actually, I think we do get into containment next week. In fact, the next lecture that I'm going to talk about is going to go back to, I think, lecture five-ish. Five or six, I can't remember, that talks about uh, lists. And uh, it's more of a data structures slash object-oriented lecture because it'll talk about enclosing classes inside of classes. You know, and putting items in a list that there's an object that's really inside of another object, and we can contain, which makes it more functional. Um, so we can create all sorts of advanced data structures, lists, queues, stacks, a bunch of stuff by using the concept of containment. It's nothing more than creating an object inside of an object. So once you can create one object, you just keep track of objects inside of the object. And each node on the tree has got, uh, you know, a left or a right, or it's got, you know, it has different components and contains different elements. So we'll talk about that, link lists and stuff like that. And uh, this is a time card class that has a time object inside of it. So it's just reiterating the point that we've got both contained. So both objects are inside of the same object. The interesting thing about containment is that we can actually kind of go in and take a look at and change different pieces of data inside of objects that are inside of objects. And we can actually take those contained objects and move them into other objects. So we can sort lists, actually move the objects out, put them into other objects, which is kind of interesting. We're not going to have, you're not going to have to do anything that, that complicated. If I were really sadistic, I'd have you do something like that. So. And if I were really sadistic, I would have you give me the firing order of all of the constructors <laughs> in an inherited object, which I'm not going to do. But at runtime, you get the base class constructor that's implicitly called first. And then we have the whole chain of constructors that reacts because we are actually creating objects of all of the different types of everything that this object contains through inheritance. So remembering all of the constructors is kind of a trick, actually, when you think about it. Because you have to make sure you override the proper ones, don't really duplicate what's already existent, and make sure that you can create a constructor that provides all the previous constructor information so it can all be built correctly. So you have all of the different pieces of the puzzle put together, per se. And uh, well, here's, here's how it actually kind of like given class X. In fact, we saw this in one of the examples already uh, recently. If X is derived class with the base class, constructor is executed first. Next, the constructor of the member object, if any, is constructed using their own default constructors. And then uh, finally, the body of X constructor is executed. 
which is why if you're kind of going to build on previous constructors, what you can do is you overload it. So the concept of overloading takes and says, well, it's a time class, but we have payroll on top of time or something. So we have money hours, minutes, and seconds. And maybe the one before just had hours, minutes, and seconds. So we can provide what this one needs, and this one needs, and this one needs, all in one shot, essentially. And have all of the constructors do their own functionality. That actually, learning how to overload constructors and overload methods is a talent versus overwriting. Because once you overwrite something, you've destroyed your inheritance. <laughs> so there are some students who write with just overwriting, and they don't ever overload. Uh, so once you learn, I mean, it's kind of a... When you start working with inheritance, you have some people that actually know how to do it, and they overload and overwrite when necessary. And then you have some that just overwrite, and you wonder, why in the world are they even extending? When they're, they're overwriting everything, and they're creating another class, essentially. They're duplicating all of the work instead of actually inheriting what's there. So the, inheritance is actually kind of tricky. It does take some practice, actually, to, to master correctly. So That was twofold. That was putting all the pieces together of everything we've talked about to date. It's your midterm review session. It's lecture number 11 off the Hacker website. Great source of information because what I'm going to do on this midterm that I'm going to release next week. So next time when we come to class, it'll be available and I'll go over it. I'm not going to answer questions like, what does a constructor mean? <laughs> or what does overloading or overwriting mean? Instead, I'm going to have, like, answer questions where if everyone gives me the same answer, then I know you cheated because there's no two ways of answering. Just no, no two students are actually going to give me the same example. It's going to be writing some stuff, answering some questions. It'll be more hands-on kind of practice. It won't be multiple choice. Uh, some of it might actually be fill in the blank or short answer kind of variety. Half of it is written already, and that's all writing source code. The other half I have to decide on, essentially. But... You'll have three or four weeks to complete it, and it'll be uploaded into the I2 EMS, and it'll be count as your midterm. So if you came in a little bit late, you don't have to show up physically to take it. It is a take-home midterm, and I'll have more information on it next week. So that is all for today. Any, any questions? We're done. <laughs>